So now with regards to wind pressure, uh, these represent the flow of air, the flow of the wind. Uh, so I've got a house here. As the wind hits this house, we've got a windward side. That's the side that the wind is hitting directly. And then there's a leeward side. Uh, there's also going to be an uplift force on the roof, as you can see there. And uh, we've got something called the static wind pressure, Q sub S, which is based on the basic wind speed. Uh, the basic wind speed, you could obtain that from uh, a map. It depends on uh, where you are geographically. So a Q sub S, static wind pressure, 0 0.00256 V squared for U.S. units, uh, where V would be in miles per hour. It would be 0.613 V squared if uh, we're dealing with a metric system. So the Q sub S, uh, static wind pressure based upon the wind speed. Uh, the wind speed depends upon the local geography. Uh, the standard conditions we're assuming, uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that's 15 Celsius, and a sea level pressure, which is 29.92 inches of mercury, that's 101.3 kilopascals if you're in the metric system. So we calculate Q sub S, and then multiply that by appropriate factors to calculate the design wind pressure. So there's different variations of this formula, so you would have to uh, check with uh, whatever the code is that you're following. Also worth mentioning is that if pressure is positive on the windward side, then it will be negative on the leeward side, uh, because there's suction on the leeward side of the building. Now for a tall building, uh, with regards to height, uh, the force of the wind is stronger at uh, higher elevations, and so the top of the building would be subjected to stronger wind force than would the bottom be. And uh, if there's a really tall building that's being designed, there may even have to be a wind tunnel study done. Uh, they can create models and even rotate the model in a wind tunnel to model different angles at which the wind might hit the building. Okay, for a 20-foot tall building, calculate the resultant wind force at each level. So a very simple example, I only have a second floor and a roof. So the wind force at each level, well, the second floor, uh, there's a certain portion of the wall that's tributary to that. So the tributary area from here to here. Okay, so this area, actually, let me use a different color. This right here, that portion of the wall is tributary to uh, this portion of the wind load. So I'm assuming a trapezoidal wind load distribution that's 12 pounds per foot at the very base and a 20 pounds per square foot uh, up at the roof. Okay, so this portion right here, this load right here is tributary to what will be carried by the second floor. And then as far as the roof is concerned, trying to find a different pen uh, for the roof. This portion is tributary to the roof. So this part that I'm outlining in purple, uh, that wind load will be carried by the roof. Okay, so I want the resultant. I want to calculate the resultant of this portion that will be carried by the second floor. And then I want to calculate the resultant of this portion that will be carried by the roof. Okay, put some dimensions on there. Uh, this portion that is uh, acting on the roof, this portion of the wind load that's acting on the roof, uh, five feet high. Now I'm assuming that each of these floors is 10 feet. Okay, so this is five feet. I've got this trapezoidal purple load, five feet. Uh, the magnitude of the wind, 20 pounds per square foot at the top. 18 at the bottom of the uh, load that is applied to the roof. And then uh, this second portion of the wind load that is carried by the second floor at 10 feet high. Uh, I've got a trapezoidal load that's 10 feet high. Uh, the magnitude of the wind at the top 18 pounds per square foot, at the bottom 14 pounds per square foot. So I want to calculate the resultant of the, the purple, uh, the, the wind load that I've shaded in purple, and the wind load that I've shaded in blue. Okay, so I took this trapezoid. See the purple trapezoidal load? The purple trapezoidal load, I drew that separately. Okay, so this is the 
trapezoidal load acting on the roof. I broke it up into a, a rectangular portion, didn't draw it to scale, and a triangular portion. So I calculate the resultants of those two. So for the triangular portion, R sub 1, area of a triangle, 1 half base times height. So the base, 5 feet. The height, 2 pounds per square foot. So uh, 5 pounds per foot. Now that's uh, pounds per foot because that's acting in and out of the paper. In and out. So I'd have to know the length of the building. If I knew the length, then I'd multiply the length by 5 pounds per foot to tell me the total resultant acting on this building. So R sub 1, 5 pounds per foot, uh, distributed along the length of the building perpendicular to the view that we're currently seeing it at. And then R sub 2, 5 times 18, that's just the area of a rectangle, 90 pounds per foot. So the resultant force on the roof, R sub 1 plus R sub 2, 95 pounds per foot, acting in and out of the paper. So now I want to do a similar analysis for uh, what is acting on the second floor. I want to calculate the resultant of this wind load acting on the second floor. Okay, for the second floor, okay, I'm taking this trapezoidal wind load and breaking it up into triangular and rectangular. So R sub 3, that's the resultant of the triangular portion, 1 half base times height, 1 half times 10 foot times 4 pounds per square foot. That's the 20 pounds per foot in and out of the paper. And then R sub 4, the resultant of the rectangular, 10 feet times 14 pounds per square foot, that's 140 pounds per foot. I add those two together, and I get 160 pounds per foot. That's along the length of the building. So 160 pounds per foot uh, in and out of the paper. And notice the, uh, where the resultants act. So R sub 4 is 5 feet up, but R sub 3 would be farther than that. I remember that the centroid of a triangle uh, one third away from the taller side. Uh, so this dimension in here, that would be one third of 10 or 3.33 uh, uh, feet approximately. Uh, so now I know the resultant load on the second floor and I know the resultant load on the roof. Okay, so going back to this, uh, how to calculate the overturning moment uh, this wind is going to want to turn over the building. Uh, so I maybe want to take the moments about that point. Uh, I could find the resultant of the entire load. Uh, that might act somewhere here. The centroid of the trapezoidal load is somewhere there. Uh, that would tend to want to turn this over. Uh, what is base shear? Uh, the base shear, I'll call it V. Uh, so that's to keep the building from sliding. So other things to calculate would be the overturning moment and the base shear.